Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> Hank? Before we uh, you know, have the pleasure of Richard reading for us, I just want to mention Lush Life. I don't know how many people have read this book, but OK. Well, this was published in 2008. And uh, what Richard presented is this very neighborhood we're talking about tonight, set in the Lower East Side, gentrifying Lower East Side. And what you presented in this book really has, now six, seven years later, really has come to fruition. Um, and the warning was that when the, a neighborhood like this is gentrified and everything looks clean and shiny and new, you can still get your ass mugged out here and killed. <laughs> if you happen to be a little drunk or not paying attention or you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, this can happen. Or people just resent your ass for being in their neighborhood, which is still their neighborhood as far as they're concerned. Right, so here we are, all these years later, day after St. Patty's Day, where your book begins. What? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's all yours, waiting for you to read. Oh, Daddy, OK. Um, I just wanted, before I start, I just want to say two quick things. I really, this museum was so helpful to me when I was writing Lush Life. I mean, they opened their doors to me. I went on so many housing tours that at some point the staff offered me a job as an educator. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I said, nah, nah, I need to make money. <laughs> and um, no, but I was just, it was just fantastic. My, my family started out at 81 uh, Orchard Street, which I don't think exists anymore. And Henry was amazingly uh, good to me. He took me through the Chinese element. Uh, it was in a Fujianese Chinese. I guess it was Cantonese Chinese? Or? That's the Cantonese part. Yeah, well, he took me you know, to all the finer Chinese restaurants. No, he, uh, he <laughs> took me through the tenement world. He showed me how to go through four buildings without ever seeing the sidewalk. <laughs> and he took me to the shrine where his, uh, the shrine where his parents were. Um, and he was just wide open, generous for me. And for that, I'll be eternally grateful to him. And now I'm going to throw him to the wolves. Uh, <laughs> you're done. I don't need you anymore. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read a little bit, and uh, we'll take it from there. It's not on it. Oh, yeah, it is. All right, so I guess you're all wondering um, why I brought you here. Um, that's not that funny. Right, so the Whites is basically, among other things, a story of detectives who have retired, who have, who in, into deep retirement are still obsessed with the one that got away, the one perp that they couldn't bring to justice and has committed a horrific crime on their watch. And uh, now they're down in their basements or as private, you know, security guys. And they're, uh, they're still going through pilfered files that they took from the precinct and making calls to, you know, the, uh, the luncheonette guy that served coffee to the, to the shooter that morning. We never, nobody ever interviewed him. Meanwhile, it's such a cold case. It's like freeze dried. And they can't give it up. And uh, it's, it's about people obset, obsessed with catching near Moby Dick. And they're Ahabs, and so I've France made up this word for the one that got away as whites. They're whites. But there's a guy in the book that has his own white, has nothing to do with the main character and his crew. His white happens to be the main character's wife, because he's convinced that his wife had done something when they were kids living in the Bronx in a tenement that led uh, drug, you know, sort of button men for drug dealers to his own apartment where they shot and killed his younger brother, at which point this cop and his older brother, who was even scarier than him, found the guys that did the shooting and beat him to death, at which point the guys who, were beat, who had been killed had buddies, and they went and killed the older brother, so it's two down in his family. A week later, his mother had a heart attack and died. Uh, too much grief. So, and he blames the main character's wife. That's his wife. 
And he's just, he's quote unquote the villain of the book, although I try to make it as confusing in terms of like boo hiss as possible. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I'm just going to introduce the guy. His name is Milton Ramos. He's half Puerto Rican, half Jewish. And he's just, he's sort of like a rogue detective. Um, i trying to angle this right way. Come on, man, got to be done. <clears throat> the handcuffed drunk in the back seat had lost $3,000 betting on the NCAA Final Four and decided that it was the fault of his wife's face, which he promptly set to rearranging. March Madness, I was you, that would be my defense, Milton's partner said without turning around. Fuck her and fuck you. You know what? Stick with that attitude because judges hate sincere remorse. <laughs> and what are you, the drunk said, squinting at Milton uh, sitting silently behind the wheel. Excuse me? Seeing the guy's face in, via the rear view mirror. You know what SPIC stands for? The drunk leaned forward, his alcohol-fueled malice expanding, searching. Spanish, Indian, colored, otherwise known as greaser, savage, nigger. Put them all together and you get one big fucking unibrow monkey, you. Milton pulled the car alongside the Roberto Clemente Park, then turned off the ignition. He sat there for a moment with his hands palms up in his lap. Can we not do this, Milton? His partner asked with an air of resignation. Ook, ook, from the back seat. Milton popped the trunk via the lever beneath the steering wheel, got out, and walked to the back of the car. The fuck's he doing, the drunk asked. Oh, shut up, the partner said, sounding both angry and a little depressed. The rear door opened abruptly, and Milton lifted the passenger out of the car by his elbow. In his free hand, he carried a telescoping baton and a grease-smudged towel. The fuck are you doing? Without answering, Milton Frog walked his prisoner into the maw of the park until he found what he considered a suitable spot. Not too open, not too constricted, and branches low enough to grip. What are you doing? Get down, please. What? Milton popped him in the chest, and the drunk was suddenly lying face up in the grass, his shoulders on fire from the impact of landing with his hands cuffed behind his back. Jesus, man, what are you doing? Near pleading now, his voice suddenly much closer to sober than a few minutes before. Milton knew he should never have been given a gold shield. It was a misguided reward for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, a barbershop doing a holdup in his own Bronx neighborhood when two assholes with 38s had come in while he was buried in aprons, towels, and shaving cream. The shop was a known numbers drop, easy pickings, and after they kneecapped one of the barbers, Milton kicked his chair around on its swivel and started shooting from beneath his polyester body bib, which promptly caught fire. By the time, <laughs> by the time his barber whipped off the flaming sheet, he had second-degree burns on his left arm and thigh. Both perps, one shot in the throat, the other in the face, survived but went directly from Misericordia Hospital to the tombs. The mayor and the police commissioner came to see Milton in the burn unit of that same hospital, the commissioner presenting him with his detective shield in front of the cameras. The question put to him was, where do you want to go? Where? He wanted to go wherever he could hide. Patrol had always been his thing, the street his wheelhouse, frontier justice, an eye for an eye, and the culling of, informa culling of information through extracurricular beatdowns. He would be a terrible detective, and he knew it. Not too bright with paper trails, not particularly subtle or patient in an interview room, and possessed of a freakishly violent yet icy temper when provoked. Since the shootout at the barbershop, he'd been transferred to seven different precincts in five years. Truculent and inept, he was a burden to each squad until he landed at the four sticks in the Bronx. Even before Milton arrived, the lieutenant got there, got the message that you are doing a great job, lieutenant, with Detective Ramos. We all appreciate it. No more hot potato. Milton's new boss made the savvy decision to stash him in the burglary squad, which averaged 35 cases a month, all difficult to solve. But even in that EO world of low expectation, he managed to go three years without a single arrest at which point he became the supervisor of night complaints, his job to come in at 8 a.m. 
and farm out the complaints that had accumulated since the previous midnight to the other incoming day tour detectives, a house cat gig that reeked of dunce cap. But after a long stretch in that purgatory, a new boss finally put him back in the regular squad, and six months after that, there wasn't a known actor in the 4-6, known perp in the 4-6, who didn't come to dread hearing the phrase, usually spoken in a low-key, near-distracted monotone, get out of the car, please. <laughs> Milton took the dirty towel and carefully folded it into a thick band. He then straddled the drunk and laid the towel across his throat. Snapping the telescoping baton out to its full length, he perched it lengthwise along the center of the towel. Carefully stepping on the narrow end with his right foot, he pressed the steel rod into one side of the guy's throat. Then, holding onto a branch in order to keep his balance and modulate the pressure, he placed his other foot on the handle end so that now his full weight was coming down on the Adam's apple. That weight fluctuating between 180 and 200 pounds, depending on the time of the year and what holidays had just passed. <laughs> the drunk, suddenly bulging eyes turned to damp golden red, and the only sound he was capable of making was a faint peeping like a newborn chick heard from one farm over. After 30 seconds or so, Milton stepped off the baton one foot at a time then squatted and lifted the thick towel beneath the throat. S lifted the thick towel. The throat was unblemished. He replaced the towel on the guy's throat and once again balanced the baton across the center. One more time. The drunk shook his head, even the weak peeping sound gone. Come on, Milton rose to his height, found his balance again at both ends of the rod and started seesawing. In case I never get to see you again. Well, that's old Milty. <laughs> so, like I said, Milton is haunted. Milton's killed the two guys that killed his brother. And uh, he's also a widow, and his wife was a victim of a hit and run. And at this point, this is a tiny section. He is visiting his daughter's third grade class. And it's career day, you know. And he, um, what are you laughing at? <clears throat> now, he's on his way to, to see his aunt at a place called Daughters of Jacob. That's the half Jewish side. And his daughter is in Rose of Lima. That's the uh, Roman Catholic side. Rose of Lima, daughter of Jacob. Ten minutes in either institution made him feel like he was breathing air through a pinched straw. Vis visiting both in the same day left him feeling like a club seal. First that fucking school, some kind of parent career day event that had him standing there rocking from foot to foot like a beetle browed dummy in front of two dozen third graders. The good looking lay teacher in the back of the room nosed down in paperwork, not even listening or raising her eyes to him as he mumbled his way through the joys of the job. <laughs> and all those questions. Did you ever kill anybody? No. <laughs> Parentheses to himself. One, but he had it coming. Can I see your gun? I'm not carrying one. No, you can't see my goddamn gun. That's what he's thinking after. Did you ever come to my uncle's house? Who's your uncle? <laughs> Ruben Matos. He lives on Sheridan Avenue. Yeah, once. <laughs> At least. How much money do you make? Enough to pay tuition here. Do you ever get mad at Sophia? That's his daughter. Never. Never. How come she's so fat? <laughs> Milton looking to his daughter, seated front and center, staring at her, staring at him with resigned eyes. Then back at the kid who asked a question, how come you're so ugly? <laughs> Is her mommy really dead? <laughs> yes. How did she die? Hello? Milton called to the half, to heads down half a nun in the rear of the room. What are you doing back there, smoking crack? <laughs> That's not a nice question, Anthony, the teacher said, still not looking up. What's your favorite team? The Red Sox. Boo! <laughs> Do you like Big Poppy? I am Big Poppy. <laughs> and again, did you ever kill anybody? I said no. Two, but they had it coming. <laughs> Three. And he's, his daughter is obese, and 
his whole family's dead except for her. And um, he has a housekeeper from Guatemala. And she's, uh, she takes care of the kid. She's her de facto mother. And um, occasionally, they're a little bit more than housekeeper and employer. And her name is Marilis Irizarry. And this is Milton thinking here. Marilis was throwing him all night. First, she wanted to do something in bed that they never did before and that made him blow his top in about two minutes flat. Then, still turned on by what they'd just done, they went at it again. They were strictly one-shot lovers, so that was the second first, Marilis moaning all the way through. Normally, they were so silent that you could be sleeping in, in the same room with them and not wake up. So that right there was the third first. All three groundbreakers coming to pass in about a half hour. They were both by nature physically modest people, so even though they had just fucked like banshees, when she finally came out of the bathroom still naked, Milton had no idea what to rest his eyes. And instead of immediately getting dressed like she always did, Marilis just sat on the edge of the bed without making any move for her clothes. Hey, Milton. He had never heard her say his first name out loud. Somehow they managed to live amicably under the same roof for 40, 50, 60 hours a week without ever saying each other's names. And he'd be lying if he said her doing so now didn't make him feel uncomfortable. What's up? Still looking away from her water-dappled skin. I'm pregnant. His first reaction was that she had just become pregnant in the last half hour, <laughs> which was maybe why she had taken so long in the bathroom. <laughs> what do you mean? The question sounded stupid, he knew, but still. She didn't answer. Even in a state of low shock, he would not insult her by asking if, if she was sure it was his. Okay, Milton said carefully. So what are you thinking? Her blue-black Indio hair, instead of being brushed straight back from her face as usual, had been carefully combed into long, wet bangs that made her look a few pounds lighter a few years younger. Because whatever you're thinking, Milton said, I'll help you out. Thanks, she said, still making no move to cover herself. I mean, now is not a good time for me, but anything I can do. Much to his relief, she finally began reaching for her clothes. But so just tell me, uh, what are you thinking? I'm thinking it's a boy. <laughs> you can tell, huh? I have two sons, seven brothers, and seven uncles. It's a boy. <laughs> okay. He felt stoned, but not so badly that he couldn't deal. She stopped reaching for her clothes and looked at him full on. Look. I don't want nothing from you, and I'm okay raising them on my own. But that means I got to go back to Guatemala to be with my family. So pretty soon I can't take care of Sophia anymore, and I can't, can't take care of you. That's all I'm saying. That's too bad, Milton said, both saddened and relieved. So later that night, on his campaign to, to terrorize Carmen and her family, he's sitting in a, a, in, in a, outside of a hooker and dope motel, in the Bronx where Carmen's younger brother is, is doing his sociolo so, sociology doctorate. You know, it's sex workers, a community of sex workers and drug workers. Blah, 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 blah. And he's just sitting there with a baseball bat in the car ready to, you know, just beat the shit to, out of the guy, even though he doesn't not like the guy, just to further scare Carmen. But then he starts thinking about, um, what's her face, Marilis, uh, being pregnant. And... Um, He's thinking, well, scientifically it's his, but mostly it's hers. But then he just starts thinking, well, you know, my life is, I'm down to two people in my family myself. And, you know, if I go after these people, if I kill somebody, they're going to take me away. Sophia's going, you know, uh, taken by the state, and our family is obliterated. So he changes his mind, and instead of, like, taking a baseball bat to Carmen's brother, he drives back to uh, Marilis's house in East Harlem about 4 in the morning. After he'd identified himself a half a dozen dimes, I had a uh, black and stormy report. It wasn't that stormy and it wasn't that black. After, and these glasses suck. After he'd identified himself a half a dozen times through the steel door of her East, East Harlem SRO, Marilis, wearing a polyester nightgown, cautiously opened up the scent of her skin lotion, pleasantly knocking him on his ass. I should have called, he said, eyeing the steak knife in her left hand. What's wrong, she whispered, her eyes wide with alarm. Nothing. Can I come in? 
He had never been here before, and he was surprised by the number of plants she kept both hanging and potted, and not so surprised by the army of religious tokens, the medallions and silver icons that festooned her walls, the plaster saints that stood on her dresser and night table, Maris's minuscule home like Guatemala in a box. There was nowhere to sit but the bed. He took the time he needed to compose what he wanted to say, but once he got good and going, he doubted he had ever uttered so many continuous words in his life. This is Milton basically proposing. So after my, what happened to my family, I lived with my Aunt Pauline for a few years. She got me to finish high school out by her. I can't hardly remember any of my classes or teachers, but I played a little football, and I enjoyed that. Then after graduation, I worked construction on and off. I was a bouncer in a few titty bars in Williamsburg when it was still like that. Got hired as a bodyguard for Fat Assassin, which was a good gig until he wanted me to start lining up girls for him this one night in some club like I was his fucking sex gopher. I mean, as I look back on it, me swinging on him in front of his people wasn't the smartest thing to do, but. And then so, of course, we wound up taking it out back, which turned out very bad for the both of us, you know, in our respective ways. After that, I kind of lost myself for a year or two. The less said about that, the better, until the girl in the neighborhood that I liked, who was a police cadet, started talking that up. And at that time, I figured, well, that's one way to keep myself out of trouble. But they rejected my application because they didn't have any college. So I went to Medga Evers in Brooklyn, but only for a year, reapplied, got in, graduated, got my shield, got married, had Sophia, as you know, lost my wife, as you know, taking a breather, thinking, what else, what else? With women, there was a girl, Norma, in, I think, ninth grade. That was the first time. A few one-time things, some girlfriends, but nobody for long. My wife, of course, plus I wasn't paying, I wasn't above paying for it now and then, especially at first after she died. Then you, of course, you know, the way we do. <laughs> what else, what else? I drink too much, as you know, and I guess that's it. Of course that wasn't it, but there would be time for telling the rest later. So, Milton looking at her perched on the foot of her own bed, the hanging plants behind her head, making him think of a jungle cat emerging into a clearing. So what do you think? When he left 45 minutes later, she kissed him on the mouth, which made him jerk back with surprise, then avidly leaned in for more. All these firsts. But don't answer yet. Let me make sure I get the right place here. So now they're going to go as, as a threesome, Sophia, Marilis, and Milton. Um, and he takes them to an Applebee's. It's like their first n night out as a family. This is a tribute to my wife, and she'll know why. She'll... Marilis, watch. Sophia's eight years old. Marilis, watch. Sophia shouted, blow darting the torn wrapper hanging from her straw across the small table into her father's chest. Don't call her Marilis anymore, Milton said. Why not? Marilis caught Milton's eye. Go slow. They had never gone out of the house as a threesome before, and this dinner at Applebee's was something of a test drive. The waitress arrived with their dinner orders, double barrel whiskey sirloin for him, double crunch shrimp for the lady, and a fiesta chop, chicken and spinach salad for Sophia, who immediately went into a jaw-quivering sulk. How would you like Marilis to come live with us, Milton said. Yeah, 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 his daughter shouting up the storm again. Easy, easy, he winced, although the din level of the room approached that of a machine shop. <laughs> Can she sleep with me? Milton looked at his fiancée, a half-smile threatening to break across his face. Scraping off the breading, Marilis put one of her deep-fried shrimps on Sophia's plate. So this is it, she said? I'm not working for you anymore? Of course not, Milton said. But we're, getting, we're not getting married till next month, you said. So? So I can work for you until then. Are you serious? I want you to go home and pack your stuff. I'll come by tomorrow with a van and move you in. I have a lease. Don't worry about your lease. So what do I do then? What do you mean? What do I do once I move in? Nothing. You know, just be with me. Take care of Sophia in the house. Sounds like my job without pay. <laughs> Milton blushed. If you want, I'll get you a housekeeper. How's that? Don't be ridiculous, she said. All I'm trying to say is you'll never have to worry about money again. 
I don't want anybody working for me, Marilla said. That's crazy. It's up to you. Marilla stopped eating, stared at her plate. I got a better idea. What's that? Can I say? Milton waited. My mother, Marilla said. Your mother? If she comes to live with us, she can help me with Sophia and the baby, and she loves to clean. Your mother. All I have to do is go back and get her. To Guatemala? She's never been on a plane before. Sophia quietly took a shrimp off Marilis's plate, dipped it in the ketchup atop her father's fries, neither of them paying attention. You don't want it to, Marilis said. It's your house. It's our house. Well, you're the man of it, so whatever you say goes. Sophia took another shrimp, a handful of fries. Excuse me for a minute, Milton said, then rose from the table, Marilis tracking him with anxious eyes as he made his way to the front door. A wife and two kids, okay. Milton mulling it over as he paced the empty parking lot, but the mother-in-law. Then, think of it like this. Drop the in-law part, and that leaves you with mother. Which, given that he had just lost his Aunt Pauline, the closest thing he had to one was not so bad. When he returned to the table, he found Marilis apparently having lost her appetite, feeding the rest of her breaded dinner to show Sophia piece by piece. Your mother, she's good with kids? Milton asked. She raised me, raised my sons too. How about otherwise? Milton asked. Not great. Pain in the ass? Kind of. <laughs> Sophia had become way too quiet, Milton, Milton wondering if it was ever possible to truly talk over a kid's head. To repeat, he thought, new mother, new wife, new son, all in one swoop. Then studying his already child, Sophia, working her way through the rest of his untouched fries, new grandmother too. All right, he said, lightly slapping the table, go get her. Marilis put a hand to her heart, huffed in relief. When should I go? How about tomorrow? I'll cover the airfare. I swear to God, touching Milton's hand, if you don't like her, she can go right back. It's not like she doesn't have family there. Just go get her. I can save you money on the tickets, Marilla said excitedly. My cousin's a travel agent. Well, there you go. Milton wishing she'd gone and come back already. Marilla leaned across the table and kissed him on the mouth again, which this time made him tense up, given that his daughter was right there. Oh, Milton, Marilla saying his name for the second time in his life. Oh, Milton, Sophia ate, her eyes as lightless as pebbles. Later that night, it took him most of a bottle of chartreuse, it's a disgusting liqueur, <laughs> to work up the resolve to quit drinking. <laughs> he had never been anybody's idea of a light drinker, but since the day he first saw Carmen at the, at the hospital, he'd gone completely off the rails, each night worse than the last, waking up every morning on the couch, wondering how the 1 a.m. sports recap had morphed into cartoons. Well, no excuse for that now. Milton pouring out what remained of the bottle into the sink. Still drunk on the liquor that hadn't gone down the drain, he took to wandering the house in order to start reassigning rooms. His dead wife's sewing nook, now a nursery for his new son. The sometimes fuck pad guest room, no need for that anymore, going to his mother-in-law, as well as the nearest of the three bathrooms, hers alone. What else, what else? Divide the den and make a playroom. All the hallway closets going to all the ladies, then, Running out of steam, he finally staggered off for his own bedroom, walking in and seeing it for the first time as the gray cell it had become. I'm afraid to look at the time. All right, we're getting there, we're getting there. Just two more small sections. Okay, so Marilyn is supposed to go off to Guatemala. And so she's supposed to come over at 9 o'clock, and he's going to take her. Um, to the airport, it's the next day, and he's just hammered on chartreuse. <laughs> she was supposed to come over at 9 the next morning for the money to cover her airfare, but instead Marilis showed up at 7.30, Milton opening his eyes to see her standing red-faced and trembling at the side of his bed. What's wrong? I'm so stupid, she whispered, her voice clotted with tears. She doesn't have a passport. She doesn't have anything. Who's she? More drunk than hungover, Milton sat up, stood up, then had to sit back down as the chartreuse rebooted. <laughs> My mother, why am I so stupid? Okay, all right, grinding the heels of his palms into his eyes. What time is it? Marilis dropped down alongside him, her shoulders as slumped as his own. This is a bad idea. Okay, so you'll go get her when she gets one. 
passport meaning? No, I mean getting married is a bad idea. Getting married is a bad idea since when? Last night I dreamed the priest was blessing us and my mother just crushed. Crushed? Like a flower when they speed up the movie and you see it bloom then dry up then crush down to nothing in dust because she wasn't there. Wasn't where? His skull like a soft boiled egg. There when we got married she died in her house because she wasn't with us. He took a deep breath and his back teeth tasted vile. Listen to me, taking her hand. You had a dream. It's a dream. No. Everybody has bad dreams. My God, you should see some of mine. Mine always come true, always. When I was a girl, I dreamed one of my brothers was in the hospital. The next day, he broke his back. When I married the first time, I dreamed my husband got cancer, and I buried him six months later. Then, whatever you do, don't ever dream about me. <laughs> Milton joked to, grow his smothering, to smother his growing panic. Leaning into him, Marilis broke down, her boiling tears searing into his skin. Okay, how about this? We work on getting your mother a green card, a passport, or whatever. Meanwhile, you come live with me, have the baby, but we wait to get married until you can bring her over. No. Jesus Christ, Milton started to sweat. Why not? We live like a man and a woman. Maybe the same thing happens to her. I feel like a prisoner of your brain right now. You know that? Despite the sharpness of his tone, he meant it more as a plea than a rebuke, though she seemed not to have heard him at all. We can't do it, she said, then looking at him, looking up at him like Our Lady of Sorrows. Maybe I should just go back to work for you, live by myself. You're killing me, Milton said. Maybe I should just go back to live with her. In Guatemala? Are you crazy? I don't know what to do, Milton. He shot to his feet, then immediately sat back down. What about the baby? It's still our baby. I know that, he snapped, then casting about for the next anchor. What about Sophia? She put her, her head in his lap, her hand clutching his hip. Jesus Christ, Marilis, what about me? She began to cry, her hot tears this time turning him on, which only increased his panic. Okay, he said, not raising her hand. Let's think this through. Who do you know in Guatemala? My family, she said then. What do you mean? All right, your cousin, the travel agent. Who does he know? I don't know who he knows. You know what I mean by knows, right? I think, I think so, she said then. Yeah, I do. How about you call him? He doesn't open up until 10. And call him at 10. But it was only 8, and they sat in coiled silence on the bed until 9. Then without any preliminary communication, they began to go at it. Whether it was the overlay of doom in the air or just the emotional rawness of the last 90 minutes, when he finally rolled off of her, they were both crying like babies. At 10, she went down into the den to make the call leaving him damp-skinned in his bed. He loved the idea of making a family with her, yet until now he had never thought he actually loved her. But something had changed this morning. Milton Ramis was officially in love with Marilis Irizarry. If he had a pocket knife, he would carve it into a tree. <laughs> 45 minutes passed before he heard her coming back up to the bedroom door, 45 minutes during which, during which he had been afraid so much as to blink. But when she appeared in the doorway, her relieved laughter came to his ears like a flock of butterflies. He said he has a friend, she said. Dreams, Milton said. You're crazy, you know that? Maybe, she answered, her face near radioactive with joy. Her travel agent cousin on Fordham Road in the Bronx had told her that he would be able to swing a round-trip ticket for her, Newark to Guatemala City and back, and a one-way ticket for her mother, all for $1,500, which is a good deal compared to the prices posted online. But in exchange for the deep discount, he wanted to be paid in cash. Whatever, Milton thought. The, w the winter came later in the day when Marilis called him at work to say that her cousin had made some calls to a law firm in Guatemala City with embassy connections and found out that the package price for getting her mother a passport and a U.S. work visa, both delivered within 48 hours of payment, would be 8,500 American dollars. Milton's first reaction was to balk altogether, his second to negotiate the fee. Unable to do that and fearful of losing his crazy, superstitious amosita forever over a few thousand bucks, he bit the bullet, went down to his union's pension loan unit, and withdrew the money. Whatever, whatever, whatever. So he gets her to the plane. And this is the last section, and it's a shorty, I swear. He gets her to the plane. She get, no, she gets on a, on a you know, one of those uh, buses that go from 41st Street, take you out to JFK or Newark or whatever the hell. And um, he's off, and he's just dreaming about his, his family to come. And she's supposed to call him when she gets to Guatemala. And um, she doesn't. 
and he freaks out. He reaches out to a friend in TSA, and he finds that there's nobody named Mar Marilis Irizarry flying to Guatemala City for, on any plane last night and any airport, Newark, LaGuardia, JFK. And he's freaking out. And he starts thinking, hang on, I just got a phone. Um, doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. So he's been packing, and he's, wait, her, he's packing up her apartment. And um, this guy from the TSA calls him and says, nothing. He goes, I, I check all the major airlines, Spirit, Avianca, Tapa, Taka, Copa, no Zaris on any of them. All right, Milton said, thank you. Fighting down a panic, he busied himself with unwrapping her saints until he dropped and shattered the black Madonna and child, at which point he lost his shit in earnest. Whatever happened to her, it had happened here. She had never, meet, never even made it out of the city. And then he goes to missing persons. They, they give him the run around. He's on the other side of a police desk, doesn't like it, you know. And he runs back to her apartment, just tearing apart anything he can find. And um, this is the last page and a half. Back in Marilis' apartment, he scoured dressers, drawers, and trash receptacles for anything that could help him find her, turning up nothing beyond those bullshit elixirs, her homemade botanica bruise, a never-used date book, and a set of keys that didn't fit her door. It was only after overturning half the furniture and getting down on his stomach with a mag light to peer under whatever he couldn't move that he discovered the three phone numbers written in pencil on the wall above her mini fridge. The first was to a local deli, second to a Chinese restaurant that delivered, but the third, with an outer borough area code, was to an older female Hispanic with good English. Good afternoon, this is Detective Milton Ramos from the New York Police Department Missing Persons Unit. I'm looking for Mrs. Marilis, Ms. Marilis Irizarry. Not here. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to, the woman said. Milton took a breath. Detective Milton Ramos, NYPD, your turn. Anna Guri, she said, then just Josefa Suarez. Which? Both. Do you know Ms. Ms. Irizarry? Ms. sardonically dragging out the Z sound. Yeah, she's my sister. What's going on? And when Milton, overwhelmed by the question, was unable to answer, she asked, are you really a cop? Anna Guri slash Joseph Josefa Suarez lived with her husband, three kids, and what Milton thought might be a wolf in a federally funded prefab ranch house on Charlotte Street in the former Anus Mundy section of the Bronx. All six rooms of her home spotless to the point of parboil. She looked a lot like Marilis, but then again, all India, a woman of a certain age, seemed to him born of the same womb. The three small cups of rocket fuel Bustello she served him at the kitchen table both helped and hindered his getting the full story out, breaking down his inbred reticence, but making him stammer. I don't understand, she said after he finished. Why would she be going to Guatemala? Why, I told you to bring back our mother. Our mother's dead 15 years. She said, besides, we're from El Salvador. <laughs> Hold on, hang on. The sweat, caught in Milton, the sweat caught in Milton's mustache, suddenly reeking of coffee. Well, all I can say is, the woman delicately rotating her demi tasse cup on the smooth tabletop, I hope you didn't give her any money. Richard, I love Milton Ramos. I got to yeah. tell you, you know, wh where do you get that from? That's not from a There's couple a of ride-alongs. There's a kid named Milton Ramos who's in the projects when I was growing up, and he's about 13 years old, six feet tall, and he, he was kind of like a sad sack kid, and his voice never broke. He was the biggest kid in the projects, and his voice never broke, and he had permanent slump posture, like he just didn't know what to do with himself. He was a nice kid. It wasn't that guy, but. <laughs> There's a, you know, when I, read, when I started reading that, I thought it was a backstory, you know, something innocent that was going to build up, and boy, was that not true. You know, no. I, I, just, I just gave you the, the you know, uh, the whites on $5 a day, you know, yeah. the whole trajectory yeah. run. Now, there's another uh, driving force in this, you know, it's called the, the wild geese. Can you talk about that a little? Well, the main character um, is 42 years old of uh, 
all of his friends, he's the only one not retired. And they all started out in journalistically the South Bronx, but really the East Bronx in the 90s when crack was ruling the world. And there were young guys a couple of years out of the academy and they were anti-crime and they were just like sneaker commandos, you know, and they were just running the streets, you know, tabbing up. A <laughs> it's okay. I'm okay. No problem, no problem. And they, um, they were, um, they, they were, they were having a blast. I mean, they, 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 it was their salad days, and they were all full of piss and vinegar, and they were athletes, and um, that was their glory days. And as time went, and they, they christened themselves the Wild Geese, after this international uh, Green Beret movie with Richard Burton, and um, they had a star from each continent. It was the first, you know, internationally calculated movie, but they were like you know, can-do paramilitary guys that, you know, kicked ass in Africa, took numbers later, snapping necks and cashing checks. Anyways, and, but now they're, they're all middle-aged, and um, they're not so wild anymore, except that they each have their whale, their white, and the whites start dropping like flies 20 years after the fact. I'm glad you explained that about the whites, because at first glance, I thought it was a book about white cops. And the timing of your book drops right here in the middle of all this uh, cops and Ferguson community of color. And Eric Garner. Right? How does that happen? Is that just coincidental timing? Well, I, I didn't ask for it to happen. You know, it, it had nothing to do with my book, except that any time you write a book, honestly, you know, about police interacting with poor people, you know, it's, it's connected and relevant. It's just not what I intended. If I had intended to address the... Eric Garner situation, that would have been the starter's yeast for a much more ambitious book. I'm waiting for that one. Gonna wait a long time. <laughs> well, no, I, I think it's very timely your book comes out at this time because it, you portray cops as these very flawed human beings with their own uh, uh, you know, circumstances and situations. And I think we need more of that. And I, I think we gotta get away from labeling, you know, all cops are bad, we need dead cops and, and, and all of that. Where do you find the inspiration for it? I mean, a lot of us writers would just rip something out of the headlines and, you know, we, we read the article, we've got a great story here, we'll make something up. Where do you find your inspiration from? For this particular thing? Or in general. Um, it's different for every book, but usually it's a place first, like the Lower East Side for Lush Life. Right. And then at some point, and I just immerse myself in the place. And... I, I'm not quite sure what I'm looking for, but I know this is the place. And I just hang out with anybody who'll have me. And maybe a year into hanging out, a story will happen, will come to me, either through something that really happened or just something that, like an epiphany of a kernel of how to organize this whole vast place into a streamlined, or if not stre streamlined, into a linear story that makes sense. How long did it take you to write The Whites? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I was supposed to write it in a couple of months. That's why I had a pen name. I thought it was going to be like a quickie, <laughs> and it wasn't. <clears throat> and it took four years, just like any other book. But in those four years, I was constantly leaving the book to do other projects, to pay the bills. And so it was my, I needed to do quickie work to finance my quickie, you know. <laughs> and that's... That's why they call it a quickie, I guess. <laughs> you know, in all your books, you have this uncanny sense of all these intersecting stories. And this book, I really, I lost a few days reading this book because I just couldn't put it down. And I just wonder how you, all these intersecting stories and characters and history, I really had to pay attention. Where, uh, how do you, how do you, do you have a big chart at home, like, okay, this is where they're going to intersect? No, it, it's basically, I live in Harlem. I've lived in Harlem since 2008. And I have friends that are retired homicide detectives and this and that. And I've been around cops for a long time, long enough since the 80s. And I've come across the phenomenon of cops being obsessed with one case that doesn't make any sense to any other cop because they're obsessed with their cases. But 
50% of the world's idea of paradise is utterly incomprehensible to the other 50%, and I guess that goes for hell, too. <clears throat> and um, I was always interested in that phenomena, phenomenon, why this case and why that cop, what, what rang that cop's bell, male or female. And as I was going around Harlem, you know, speaking to people for another book, these people just stayed with me and a couple of them, I just made a couple of them retired cops. I always like to have a, a real physical image in my head when I make up a character. Because as long as I can see the real face, I, I'm, it's like my talisman. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this guy justice. I don't know if that answers your whole question about it. It's just, it, you know, it just comes from just, it doesn't come to me at the desk. It comes from me out the door. But the challenge is, once you're out the door and you do all that stuff, what are you going to do with it when you get to the desk where you're going to be writing the book? And that's the difference between reporting and making art. You know, there's a, between following the Night Watch and the, the Wild Geese and Milton Ramos, there's plenty of blood and guts and gore. That's always after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> but what really uh, touched me were these small stories, two in particular that only appeared, only a couple of pages, very small but very touching. And I wonder where they come from. Can you talk about Horace Woody? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what I really loved, the thing that, one of the things I really wanted to get into is I wanted to write like Ouija took photographs. I wanted to just, you know, something comes, and there is a real unit at the police department called Night Watch. And I've been saying this every book reading, and this is like the 11th time, I'm trying to make up a new, like a fantasy squad, you know, called, you know, the, the piercers of the lance or something. Anyways, these guys, you know, it's, it's male and female, six to eight detectives, and their job is they're, they're on duty from 1 a.m. to 8 a.m. because there are no active detective squads in any of the local precincts during those hours in New York. And they just have to respond to all felonies or potential felonies from Fort Tryon Park to South Ferry. And I like that job. And, and the main character is, is the, the, the uh, lieutenant of the Night Watch because you go from the most... Um, Ridiculous job, two drunk coeds uh, dressed like uh, Xena princess warriors, slashing at each other with foam axes, and it's, and they get the report it's mangled. It's a, you know a double homicide in progress, you know, and they just went to the same costume party, <laughs> and got hammered, and they got into a cat fight, or you go to a triple a triple murder, you go to a smash and grab, a uh, jewelry store robbery. Um, it just took you everywhere, and I just felt like Ouija. I wanted to be like Ouija, sit in that car, you know, and something comes over the radio, and there I go, and snap, snap, snap. So that was very important to me. And what was the question? <laughs> Horace Woody. Oh, Horace Woody. Glad you asked that. So one of the, one of the more low-key jobs is, that Night Watch gets is there's a guy in a, uh, in, lives in a, in a housing project, and he was... Uh, uh, he, he got a gold medal in the 1972 Munich Olympics. And um, he was part of the 4x4 relay team. And somebody stole this Olympic medal now in 2015. And so they go over there, and Horace Woody is drunk. His girlfriend, every time he gets drunk, he tells his girlfriend, I'm, I'm going to pawn that thing. I'll start a new life. And so she just hides it around the apartment. You know, and she doesn't care. She'll give him the money, but to her, it's American history. He's not getting that. And so that's one of the jobs. So he has to go into the bathroom with her. She digs it out of the laundry hamper, you know, and she says, I'm sorry. The cops come over every week for this, but you're a detective. I'm embarrassed. They sent you over. It was just like one of the, the smaller but no less human jobs that Night Watch might have. Right. Another example of that is Wallace Oliver. Wallace Oliver. Oh, my gosh. That was kind of inspired by a guy I knew. It was just like a, an older man who had, a, who had a flower shop in Washington Heights. And um, he had a 
he was a, a former jazz musician, and he's getting really old. And this girl comes in one day, says she wants flowers, and she says, "Well, it's for my mother." And then she doesn't say anything she likes. And then he says, "All right." She goes out. She's a young girl. She comes back in three hours later. Says, um, "Do you have any job openings?" And he says, "I can barely support myself in here." She comes back at closing time, drops on his knees, goes down on him, and says, "You let me live here. You can have me anytime you want." And this guy's life is completely turned over to this young woman. He says, "I'll do anything in my life to have a hard deck again." And of course, it ends badly. You know where she keeps taunting him and insulting him, and finally puts his hands around her throat, and it's an aggravated assault. And he tells his story. He's like 73 years old, she's 27, and um, he's going away. But it's the story of the two of them together and how he threw out his wife and threw out, threw away his apartment to live in the flower shop with her. You know what's been said of you. That you have more talent, more ambition than crime writing genre can can accommodate. Now, is that just a snobby statement from somebody, or do you no, feel like first, a genre writer? First of all, I think you know. You, you, so, what's the last part? Do you do you consider yourself? You feel like a genre writer? No, no, I can't. Even, no, I, it, listen. The thing about genres are ghettos, and anybody who writes really well and resonantly in that quote-unquote genre, transcends the genre. So genre responds to people whose work is, feels limited, but if you have an expansive take on a situation and you need a Western setting, you need a crime setting, you need, um, I don't even know what the other genres are. Romance is off, nah, nah never mind romance. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's, it's a ghetto, and any genre writer worth their salt transcends the ghetto and is a real writer. Yeah, because I, I never saw you that way. Ever since uh, Wanderers, I never considered you genre. And, and in that, neither did the national uh, book critics or the American Arts and Letters. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all this research, I mean, uh, how much research did you actually have to do for the whites? None, because I had spent so many years, I, I did the Night Watch stuff, you know, earlier for another project. You know, I had so much uh, incident memory in the warehouse, and that was the, the, that was my fatal flaw in saying it's a quickie, because it's, oh, I'm just gonna draw on my memories, have serviceable characters, and just, you know, write, write a bang amount. Yet, the minute you start writing, you know, all your outlines go to hell, and all your, all your um, notions of what you're about to do go to hell. You don't know what you're about to do until you actually start doing it. And the book was supposed to be lean and mean. It's like a whippet, and it turned into like a Nor Norwegian lap hound <laughs> crossed with a bull mastiff and a pony. You know, I mean, the minute I said, how do you write characters? That's good enough. I mean, what, what does that mean, good enough? You mean you can do better? Yeah, but do better, you know? And next thing I know, it's like for, it takes forever because everybody's going horizontal on me when I want them to go vertical. So you had these aspirations for this really great book, and all we got was another Richard Price great book. Yeah. <laughs> My parents went to the bookstore, and all I got was this lousy The Whites <laughs> T-shirt. All right, one last question. So at the end of a long, hard writing day, when you can't lay down another word, is there a, a, a one place or a, a one thing, one person that, you, that makes it all worthwhile? I'm glad you asked me that, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> I know that at the end of my writing day, which starts as late as I can possibly start it, <laughs> and we do a shout out to Adderall here, um, and so I usually write somewhere noon or one o'clock to six or seven o'clock. And my wife works as a novelist, Lorraine Adams, and she, her office is like 20 feet away from mine. And the cookie that we have every night is Miller time. You know, we just wrap it up, say, you ready, to, you know, you ready for a treat, ready to play? Go downstairs, 
um, light some candles, uh, pop a cork, sit on the couch, and talk shit until we're starving. <laughs> and that's my cookie, and I know that's, that ends every day like that. So, yeah, yeah. I do. Man, that sounds lovely. Yep. I had Th to re the couch three times, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you. love to take questions and the way that works is because it's filmed you need to use the microphone so Ali Sheva can bring you the microphone just wait to talk until you hold it oh wait you have to come up oh my god <laughs> it's going to cut down on questions I am so happy you're here I get the opportunity face to face to tell you how wonderful your book was but you, you. know that but I found out thank you Cop talk, street talk, gritty conversation, only you write that way. My Thank question, you. have you gotten any feedback from the real gritty cops, from any detectives about this book? Well, uh, yeah, I do. For a couple of my books, what happens is one of two things. They love the book but hate the character that's based or they think is based on them. Or they avoid me. And I think... It, oh my God, they really hated the book. They feel like I ripped them off and betrayed them. But what happens is they didn't read the book and they were embarrassed. So I've, I've never heard somebody say anything to me like, I mean, so, some people will, will get all technical. Well, we don't actually do that, but the thing about, it's fiction. It's called Make Shit Up. And I remember uh, there was a guy who wound up in the model of the cop in Homicide in a, he was a homicide cop from Jersey City uh, for clockers. And um, I was right, get, getting to work on Sea of Love, and he was one of the first cops I met. And they said, well, what kind of scams do you guys run to, you know, like, you know, get, you know, to get outstanding warrant guys to actually come to you? I heard, he says, oh, yeah. I said, I heard there's this thing where you, you send out tickets that uh, you've been selected for a brunch with the Yankees. And he goes, oh, yeah, we do that. You know, one guy looked like Phil Rizzuto. We get the guys. We all, we all call each other by, you know, he's Bobby Richardson, and I'm like, you know, Thurman, uh, Thurman Thermal. And, and, um, and uh, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring him to a catering hall, or we'll even have a booking station, maybe a judge in the back room, so we can just process him right on the scene. We don't have to haul him and do this. Wow, wow, that's oh, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so... And meanwhile, he's drinking so hard and fast, you know, he's getting tennis elbow. And I'm getting loaded because I'm only having one drink to hit four of his. And so when we're done, he leaves the, the, rest, uh, the bars, uh, the, the old lion's head on Christopher Street. And he, he sort of staggers into the subway, falls down a flight of stairs, and goes home. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, that was really worth it. You know, where's the aspirin? And then um, the next morning, he calls me up. And he says, Rich, I got to tell you, I'm so sorry. I made all that crap up. I was, trying to <laughs> I was trying to impress you. And he said, I don't give a damn. I fell for it. Everybody's going to fall for it. It's in. <laughs> you know, it's just fiction, you know. And, you know, the guy know that. It's, you know, it's not like, it's, it's, it's not a textbook on police procedure. Could you talk about creating that authentic voice that you hear in character after character? In that? That, you know, it's not something that I work on. It's, some people just have an ear. Like some people have, an, it's, it's, for me, it's like a natural, in, natural facility that I have. I've always been able to imitate voices. But I also just love language coming out of people's mouths. I've always loved it. And... That's why when people say, what are the most influential uh, writers, I always include two non-writers, Lenny Bruce, because I loved his rhythm. You know, I didn't think he was he's a genius. I didn't think, I think he's a Catskills guy that was passing for counterculture. Then he got, you know, caught up in his own drama. And Lord Buckley, uh, who is a scat singer 
for, in Chicago in the 1930s, and he's a white lumberjack guy. And on record, on, he sounds like Satchmo, had this gravelly voice and this hip diddy bop way of talking. And he just turned language inside out. I couldn't even understand his monologues the first three times I heard it. But I was so exhilarated by his, the language, the language. I just love language. You know, um, I love a, I've never been able to diagram a sentence, but I love human speech. Hey, I was just wondering if you could talk about or elaborate uh, when you said uh, you, I think you said you want your characters to go vertical instead of horizontal. No, what I meant was I wanted the book to go vertical as in like lean, like a shot, you know, sorry. And, but the characters kept expanding and demanding more background and more history and, and more subtlety in their relationships to each other, which made the book go wide. I just, you know, I wanted to fire it off like a rocket, you know, but then it started going, I wanted to go straight, straight north, and it went both east and west, and maybe a little south. <laughs> so that's what I meant. Would you ever want to be a police officer? Well, that brings me to another story. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I didn't even, I, have, I didn't even exchange words with a police officer until I must have been in my 30s. No, I, I didn't know any cops. I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I, was, I had no reason to know any cops. However, um, ask me what time, I'll tell you how to build a class. Um, I, I was invited to, uh, you know the story, sorry, you know the story too. I was invited to uh, speak to a Scandinavian filmmakers conference in Denmark. And I was with the Danes first. And the Danes were like, mm, mm. <laughs> and they, they, Copenhagen has voted the uh, most well-adjusted city in the world, basically because people have very low expectations. <laughs> and anyways, this Danish guy that was hosting me that ran the Danish film school, he said, well, you know, we are the Latins of Scandinavia. <laughs> and I'm going, really? And uh, then, then all the filmmakers came from Iceland and Greenland and Finland and Norway. And you know what? The Danes were the Latins. <laughs> and at one point, just as a, did I ever want to be a cop? I was asked that question. They screened Sea of Love for, what, they rotated nations. One night I had Iceland and Finland. So it's basically, I had about 50 guys looking like you know, anorexic extras from the Vikings, you know, and they were just sitting here, like, kind of tottering. Every once in a while, one of them fell over, and nobody moved, and the guy never got up. And the first question after Sea of Love, which is a cop story, he goes, they, he said to me, why are you always drawn to policemen? And I said, that's because I have a very small penis. <laughs> and it was like, <clears throat> and... And all of, all of the guys went. <laughs> and they're going, shit, what are, you know, it was the first question. I had 45 more minutes. What do I say? No, I'm joking. I have a big penis. Or, or, or do, you know, how do you, how do you respond to people that don't get a joke? And all of a sudden you're defending your wiener girth. And... But I had, I had to eat it. For 45 minutes, I was talking to these guys. And every one of these Thor Thorvaldsons was sitting there with, with a little cartoon thought balloon over their head with a little mi micro penis in it as I was talking. So, no, I was never really attracted to cops. And I'll tell you, no, never mind. I should, let me cut it. Let me stop there. You've said elsewhere that if you want to get to know a city, you should look at their crime. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I think, I, I didn't say that. Michael Connolly said that reviewing the book. But what he meant by, if you take a crime and all the people that are involved in the investigation want the police get started, the families of both the perp and the victim, the, the people walking across the streets, one guy's a Fujinese immigrant, another guy's uh, a yuppie gentrifier, 
a third guy, you know, owns one of the new bars, you know, uh, and the murderer's right outside. Then you have the grief, you know, then you have, uh, like, the Lower East Side, then you have the grieving, like, grieving family. Maybe the kid was from the Midwest, and he was, you know, job hunting here, and he got loaded on the Lower East Side. And something happened because he ran into two kids from the projects, and he, and he you know, they, they were trying to rob him, and he went all John Wayne, and, you know, they had girls behind them, and they pulled the trigger. So you got the you Midwesterners. You, like, you got the immigrants. You have the Orthodox Jews. I'm talking about the Lower East Side. You have the Dominicans. You have the whole housing project culture. You have the police, which is its own sub-world of the Lower East Side. And all, it, it's, um, if it's a good enough crime, you're going to get to see the city. When you see, well, what caused the crime? Well, as they say, or as I say, you know, um, real estate is violence. You know, the Lower East Side is being uprooted. Some people don't want to be uprooted. Some people um, don't like the people moving in because it means the end of the, the world as they knew it. And they feel like they're going to be discarded. Other people moving in don't even see them as people. They don't even see them as physical beings. They just walk right through them. And so when, you, when two groups have a conflict like that, somebody dies, that's how you get to know the city. What was behind that? I mean, you could say it was a robbery, but what was behind the robbery? What was the guy thinking long term? What was the other guy thinking long term? That's, that's you know, an example. Or Ferguson, look at Michael Brown, Eric Garner. That's how you get to know Staten Island. That's how you get to know all these small cop duchies. A few years ago, I heard you speak, and you said that uh, you were following around an undertaker in Harlem, mm -hmm. and I wonder what became of that, because I'd love to read your take on Harlem. Well, that's, uh, my, my next book is about that, and this, I mean, but this is how I get to know a place. This is how I got to know the Lower East Side. Who'll, who'll hang out with me? I'll, I'll try to be good company. And undertakers in Harlem, somebody hooked me up with a couple of guys, you know, a lifetime Harlem uh, resident coming from the polo grounds, hooked me up with a couple, of, who knew everybody, he, he just hooked me up with a couple of guys. And who's not fascinated by, by mortality? You know, and th they can tell you, um, they can tell you the sole statistics of a neighborhood in transition. Harlem, 1990, well, we'd get eight bodies every three days. One of them might be natural, four is age, three is violence. Um, now we only get, I, I'm lucky if I get a body every three days, four days. Um, mostly diabetes, obesity, old age. You know, and through these eyes, just seeing the corpses that come in and why they're dead. And I remember the last time I talked to an undertaker, he said, um, he had a 400-pound guy come in, and um, I said, um, was it a crime? He said, yeah, a man that big whose wife won't let him take the goddamn Lipitosh because she wants a hard dick anytime she needs a hard dick, so he dies. Yeah, maybe that's a crime. I don't know. You know, and it's just, you know, but I was talking, you just, it's a, pers I, I can't describe it. I mean, what I see, I can't. I can tell you anecdotes, but it's something deeper that I'm responding to. It's stuff I can't put into words. It's just images and gestures that stay with me. So, and okay, so I'm talking to undertakers. Now I'm talking to guys who run flower shops. Now I'm talking to a young black couple that went to USC. Maybe they, one of their grandmothers grew up in Harlem. And the, the word got back, Harlem's an okay place to live. So, you know, they're moving, they're starting a family in Harlem, whereas 15 years ago, they would no sooner set foot in Harlem than I would. Or, you know, um, the Aravis that are black and the Aravis that are white, the Aravis that are Euros. I mean, then you have the old timers, the long timers. My wife, Lorraine, is working on a book about All Saints Roman Catholic Church, um, which is a massive church that the diocese is closing and it was built by affluent Irish people in 1886. 
and it's enormous. And now it's got like this motley disenfranchised, maybe 200 people from three continents. And just she's tracking the world of Harlem through that church, um, through its arrogant, arrogance and its glory days to how it, it's like if Jesus had to pick a church, he would go to All Saints. He wouldn't go to St. Patrick's. You know, he'd be very comfortable in this wreck, this Piranesi wreck. And she knows that. And she's learning Harlem through the women and the men and the priests that she's, she's encountered in the last few. You, you learn a place by b living in the place. You don't learn a place by researching a place. There's no soul in paper. That being said, like as I always say, Jane Austen never left the vi village and became Jane Austen. You know, but you know, it's a choice. And it's a, I... Lorraine and I both love reporting our novels. You know, you know, you write about what you know, but you, you, what you know can expand if you get, make an effort to know more, and that becomes your world, and your world is, the only limitations of, of your writing world is the limitations on your own curiosity and your own limitations on your own gumption. Do uh, you and Lorraine uh, talk about your work as it's in progress together? Incessantly. Cool. Um, I've ne we talk shop. It's like a busman's holiday. You know, it's, we just talk about, we talk about writing in the abstract. We talk about the, the proje projects that are literally in progress. And we both live the writer's life. And we both live the reporter's life. And... It's it's uh, it's it's a bottomless subject. Oh, one more. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I wondered how you went about refocusing yourself uh, for something like The Wire. Uh, as opposed to your expansive ideas, of how will your novels seem to take you over and yeah. go in well, the a wire, wider yeah. way? As a, the Wire's a job. I'm one of five writers writing. You know, they're responsible for 12 episodes. I, I write episodes three and six. This guy's writing episodes four and seven. You know, I read up. I know exactly what's happening leading up to my episode. I know what has to happen in my episode to set up the next guy, and when he's done and the guy after him has to set up me when I go again, it's, it's very, uh, it's an assembly line, and the creativity is in, you know, you got to do, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen in this episode, and the true creativity is how you get there, but basically you're told in the story, you don't have to do any organizational thinking. It's, it was a piece of cake. It took me three weeks on the average for each episode. question for you. Um, from the wanderers to the whites, what do you think is the biggest change in you as a writer? Growing up. I mean, I was in my 20s, and the wanderers is all about my, my buoyancy as a cocky, sort of talented, but not very wise 24-year-old. And, you know, I, I lived a lot of things, and now I'm not 24. I'm 65. I better be better. You know, but as life happened to me, my writing changed, obviously. You know, and I, I learned how to, I, at some point in the 70s, all my writing, I wanted to be entertaining. And I, I lacked a certain seriousness in my work that when I went back in the 90s and wrote Clockers and stuff, I had much more of a sense of, I want to say this, as opposed to, I want to say this, bunch of jokes. You know, I have something to say, and that's why I'm writing the book. I'm not regaling you with tales of the Bronx. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think...
We're so honored. We're so honored that you, you came here to do this tenement talk and to do the reading. Um, a few things for all of you. Um, the book is available at our shop, and if you buy it here tonight, it's 15% off, and, and, and you can have it signed. Then, to add to that, to make this really New York, I love how both um, our speakers tonight spoke a lot about place. Um, so one thing that's just just across Delancey Street is the new Russ and Daughters Cafe that has a hundred-year-old history here on Orchard Street, but now a new restaurant went from a push cart to an appetizing store now to this beautiful restaurant, and they will give you 10% off your meal if you show a purchase of a book here at the store. So we're roping you in in a couple ways. But I also want to um, invite you back to the museum. And one last thing about Lenny Bruce, because I'm a huge Lenny Bruce fan. And again, to go back to the idea of space, he has a wonderful bit where he talks about uh, a candy store owner, a candy store uh, owner on Hester Street who finds a, a bottle in the back of a store and there ends up being a genie in the bottle. So I won't, it's, it's called Genie in a Bottle. You can go home and Google it. But the, the idea of the voices and the voices coming to play, I strongly recommend it. So please, uh, please stay, buy a book, have it signed, go to Russ and Daughters, and come back next week. We have Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She has not come back from the dead, but um, a wonderful historian, Lara um, Vapnik, and Alice Kessler Harris, who's a wonderful historian, the preeminent US women's historian, will be here to talk about this wonderful labor leader. Um, and we will have an actress bringing back her voice, if not her life. Again, thank you, and thank you, Richard, and thank you for being here.